Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Al Gasbridge, and on behalf of the University of Georgia Student Government Association and the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences Student Ambassadors, I'd like to welcome you to the 150th anniversary celebration of the Land Grant Legacy, a panel discussion on the past, present, and future of the moral lives. Tonight, we get the opportunity to hear from the state's leaders in agriculture, engineering, and the military sciences on the current state of their field and plans for the future. Each one of these fields is critical in the continued progression of this university's emergence as one of the most prestigious in the country. I'd like to extend a thank you to each person in attendance this evening, and a special thank you to our panelists for participating. 150 years is a monumental occasion, and coupled with a rich history and reputation of the University of Georgia, each field represented in the Moral Acts has flourished on this campus. We look forward to what the future holds. At this time, if everyone makes sure their cell phones are turned off. <coughs> I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Fromm, Vice President for Public Service and Outreach for the University of Georgia. Thank you. It's my pleasure on behalf of the University of Georgia to welcome you to this evening's event honoring the University of Georgia's land grant uh, before we begin, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce a few distinguished uh, visitors and participants we have with us this evening. Uh, first is Georgia State Agriculture Commissioner Gary Black, and Mr. Black will be introduced more fully in a minute. Representative Chuck Williams, Senator Frank Ginn, Mr. Billy Skaggs, Chief Executive Officer of the Georgia Department of Agriculture. Ms. Laura Meadows, Laura's Director of the Vincent Institute of Government and the College of Agriculture alum. Tate O'Rourke from Senator Isaacson's office. Dale Threadgill, the inaugural dean of the College of Engineering at the University of Georgia. And Bill Flatt, former dean of the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. Hi, Bill. I'm also pleased to introduce uh, Bob Islaw, who will be our moder moderator this evening. Bob is director of the Center for Forest Business, and, and I thought the panelists would be interested to know that Bob is crafting his stump the panel questions. <laughs> As Vice President for Public Service and Outreach at the University of Georgia, I have the honor to be able to help carry out our land grant mission every day around the state. The people I'm privileged to work with at UGA are deeply committed to the land grant ideal of connecting the resources, knowledge, and expertise of the University of Georgia to serve the people of the state of Georgia. Whether it's through developing small businesses, helping governments be more efficient and responsive to citizens, or strengthening communities and schools, our eight public service units and cooperative extension are working every day in some corner of the state to improve the lives of Georgians and to make the state more prosperous. The University of Georgia's tradi tradition of service to the state is long and actually pre precedes the passage of the first Moral Land Grant Act. I think we would all agree that the university's public service tradition as is, is as relevant today in the 21st century as it was in the 19th century. Through its land grant mission, this institution helped to develop Georgia's agricultural economy during the 19th century. And this agricultural economy, in turn, helped to develop a middle class in Georgia, to build an infrastructure, and co contribute in so many ways to Georgia's progress and development. <coughs> Agriculture continues to be vital for Georgia's development and prosperity, and as a leader in agricultural innovation, UGA will look to new ways to ensure that Georgia is competitive in our global economy. Thank you all again for being here this evening. Thank you to the participants in this evening's event. And at this time, I will ask Anna McIntyre, a student in the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, to come forward with a brief history of the Moral Act. Thank you, Dr. Fromm, and thank you everyone who can make it here tonight. Um, we're just going to go over a very brief history and more detailed histories in your playlist. 
But on July 2nd, 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the first of the two moral acts into law, granting every state that stayed in the Union 30,000 acres of public land for every member of its congressional delegation. The states were to sell this land and use the proceeds to establish colleges in engineering, agriculture, and military sciences, thus establishing land grant universities like this one. The Moral Act shifted the purpose of education from classical studies, allowing for more applied studies that would prepare the students for the world they would face outside of the classroom. Government now directly supported education. The Moral Acts not only changed the face of education and made room for our growing and ever-changing country, but more importantly, they ensured that there would always be money to finance educational facilities and that there would be continual government support of these institutions. Now I'll have um, Ms. Hillary Thornton. She's one of the senators for the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. She's going to come to the stage and she will briefly introduce our panelists and we will begin the discussion. Hillary? Thank you, Anna. Good evening again and welcome. My name is Hillary Thornton and I'm one of the senators for the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. Tonight, we are honored to have such a distinguished list of panelists among us. These individuals are some of the very best that our state and university have to offer, and we are so thankful that each and every one of them could come and speak with us tonight. To begin our introductions, we have Georgia's Agricultural Commissioner, Gary Black. Commissioner Black is a well-respected leader in Georgia, and, his, and he has a legacy both at the University of Georgia and in the agriculture industry. As a student here at the University of Georgia, Commissioner Black was a campus leader serving as Agco Council's Vice President and was inducted into the Agon Honor Society. Commissioner Black graduated with a degree in Agricultural Education from the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences in 1980. Next we have Dr. Scott Engel, who became Dean and Director of the University of Georgia's College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences in 2005. Dean Engel earned his bachelor's degree in agronomy and master's in soil microbiology at the University of Maryland. He later earned his doctorate at the University of Missouri. The dean has also authored and co-authored some 300 scientific papers, reports, book chapters, and other publications. Lieutenant Colonel Fogel graduated from Texas A&M University with a bachelor's degree in history in 1992. He later obtained an associate's degree in French from the Defense Language Institute Foreign Language Center in Monterey, California in 2003. His most recent degree is a master's degree in public administration from Central Michigan University in 2010. The Lieutenant Colonel has served on, at many military bases across the United States and around the world. His military service career is incredibly distinguished and he has been decorated with many medals and awards. Since August of 2011, the University of Georgia has been privileged to have Lieutenant Colonel Felt will serve as a professor of military science as well as the department head for the Army ROTC. Mr. Arch Smith received his Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Economics from the University of Georgia in 1977. While at the university, Mr. Arch was an active student in the Senate, Vice President of Agco Council, President of the Collegiate 4-H Club, and was inducted into the Agamont Honor Society and the Gridiron Secret Society. In 1985, Mr. Arch began his career with the Cooperative Extension Service as a county extension agent and has since served as the Associate State 4 H Leader, Executive Director of the Georgia 4 H Foundation, and he currently serves as Georgia State 4 H Leader. Dr. Bram Berman is a Professor Emeritus of the Biological and Agricultural Engineering and Associate Director Emeritus of the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Georgia. He received his bachelor's in 1959, his master's in 1965, and a PhD in 1968, all in agricultural engineering. Since 1965, he has had over 350 publications and presentations at professional meetings. Since the mid-1980s, he has championed for the emerging discipline of biological engineering and has served as the founding president of the Institute of Biological Engineering. He has also created other organizations, including the very successful Faculty of Engineering at the University of Georgia. In his retirement, Dr. Verma remains engaged in graduate education and the advancement of comprehensive engineering at the University of Georgia. <coughs> Lastly, our moderator for the evening, Mr. Bob Bisbee, <coughs> who has been director of the UGA Center for Forest Business since 1998. He has 24 years of operational forestry experience in successive positions of responsibility in the forest industry. Mr. Isler received his bachelor's and master's from the University of Georgia 
and an MBA from Georgia Southern University. Mr. Isler is a retired colonel in the United States Army Reserve with 34 years of service. Please join me in welcoming this distinguished group of individuals. <laughs>
So, twofold. Early on, uh, prior to the Civil War, it was impossible to pass this legislation through uh, Congress, and it was generally vetoed as a block by the South voting members. So it took the Civil War, when the South seceded from the Union, the Moral Act was passed at that time. Now, unfortunately, as some of you know, the history of Georgia, once the Civil War was over and Georgia was readmitted back into the Union, um, we, were, we were pretty promptly expelled from the Union once again, I think, for somewhat bad behavior. It was not until 1870 that Georgia was readmitted back into the Union. So we got into the Moral Act, we began creating land grant universities a little later, five or six, maybe even 10 years later, than a number of other universities. But what's always been so interesting to me, while Georgia had blocked the creation of this wonderful system early on, it came on very strongly after the year 1870. Uh, this has become one of the bastions of the land grant philosophy here in Georgia. In fact, one of the other slippages that we saw going forward from the Moral Act is that we created this wonderful university in one whole research complex within our domain. Uh, but over time, we began to slip back again. And that research was not getting out to the people who needed it, farmers in particular. And uh, an individual in uh, the early 1900s, Oak Smith, if you look uh, down on South Campus, you'll find a, a couple buildings named after him. Uh, he was the one who recognized the fact that the research that was being done on this campus was not getting out to the people who needed it. He was a senator in the United States uh, Senate, and he sponsored the legislation that created a structure here at the University of Georgia and elsewhere to assure that there was a mechanism, in this case called the Property Extension Service, but for transferring knowledge from this campus out to the people who needed it, to make sure that we were relevant to those that um, were providing the resources to allow us to do what we do on this campus. We slipped back again, in my opinion. Uh, after that, it took the civil rights movement to get us over the, the next dump. And even now, I think that we are seeing, in some ways, a slippage uh, back. And we are now being held for a very different reason, but we are now being held once again accountable to make sure that what we do is relevant to the citizens of Georgia. And this is coming this time around from our elected officials in Georgia. So we have several here today. Um, Representative Williams and um, the Senator again, thank you for, for your support of the college and the University of Georgia. But I can tell you, knowing both of them well, that they are insistent that the University of Georgia be relevant to the taxpayers of the state of Georgia. And that if we don't provide information, training, teaching, extension information, and other types of information to the people that pay our salaries up at this table, uh, they will be the strong supporters that they have been for such a long period of time. And our budgets will be cut. So it all comes down to relevancy. What can we do to remain relevant to the people of Georgia who pay our salaries and to the legislators that appropriate our budget? Now remember one more time that all of us at this front table are paid by the taxpayers of Georgia. So money is taken from taxpayers and transferred to us and to you, especially if you're students, to support the things that you were doing. Whether or not you have the Hope Scholarship or not, uh, education at the University of Georgia is highly subsidized. So that money comes from the taxpayers and is transferred to you. And also remember that a lot of people that are paying taxes and that are transferring money from them to you may be poorer than your families. And they may have less ability to pay for the cost, even for their own families, for uh, your ability and our ability to be here. So this is a very important contribution that this state has made, and it's a very important doctrine of how we look at our future. We take money through the taxation process and through the lottery, and transfer that to the University of Georgia so that we can remain relevant to the citizens and then return to them the public goods that they need to continue to uh, support the University of Georgia and Fort Valley State University as well as all the other public universities in Georgia. So we have to remain relevant. That is the only way that we are going to continue to be funded in the generous way that the legislature has funded us for many years and the way, only way that we will continue to be funded going off into the future. So what can we do to remain relevant? Uh, first of all, I can promise you, as you've heard from Dr. Fromm, that 
the administration on this campus is absolutely committed to assuring that every program within this great university is relevant to the state of Georgia, that every college, every program, every institute is providing services that will be seen as additive and supportive of the university, uh, or excuse me, of our uh, Georgia economy. And, and we've heard this from President Adams directly. If we're not doing that, we better find a way to make ourselves relevant because in the long run, uh, he'll make sure that either we do become relevant or we won't be here much longer than what we're doing. So we all feel a tremendous amount of pressure, more so, I think, than at least in my career because of the economy to assure that we do remain relevant. Uh, politicians have to make very hard decisions right now. We all know that our state economy is going through some very difficult times. Uh, it looks like our economy is starting to bounce back, grow back, but we all know that we have a tremendous deficit in Washington, D.C. that we're going to have to deal with as well. And so our state politicians have already made those hard decisions. Our national politicians, whether you're Democrat or Republican, President, Congress, or Senate, uh, they're, they're going to be making some very, very difficult decisions about what gets funded and what will be funded into the, the near-term future. And again, unless we can show that they are getting a good return on their investment in us as faculty, staff, and students, we cannot expect that our funding will continue. So at this front table, we're going to do our part to assure relevancy within the state. But I know we have a lot of students here as well. And what can you do to assure relevancy? In some ways, when you look at the total University of Georgia staff, if you can include Fort Valley in there as well, you're looking at uh, somewhere around several thousand faculty and staff. Uh, that's a pretty small number when you look at what is almost 9 million people in the state of Georgia. So the, the students on this campus and our alumni that have graduated from this campus in Fort Valley and that have gone off into the state to work, that's where we are really being judged in many ways. So my message to the students in here is that you also will be lifelong ambassadors for the University of Georgia. And your, one of your main jobs will be to be relevant to society in Georgia. How can you do that? Let me first say that there's already suspicion about the students in here. You know how hard it is to get into the University of Georgia. You also know that funds are being used from taxpayers, sometimes with less means than your family, transferred to you. We went through some interesting times this summer where individuals were referred to as the 1% uh, the of our society. Well, statistically, I think the students in this room probably are the 1%. And when you look at the funds and how they are managed, that supports that concept as well. So there is some suspicion about students and this university because of our high, high standards. Well, the way we're going to counter that is by making sure that when you graduate, well, as you are students, but also as you graduate, that you will remain relevant to our society. You will be successful in your jobs and businesses. You will create jobs that employ our citizens and that pay taxes. You will provide public service and public service goods to the citizens <laughs> of this great state. And you will be the intellectual catalyst to find those solutions to our problems that we face today and tomorrow. So we're really looking to the students in here to tell our message and to make sure that the state understands that the product of this university, we're a great university when it comes to research, we're a great university when it comes to extending that information to the people who need it, but ultimately we are a teaching university and students are our most important product. So we look to you to tell that message for us and to make sure that you remain relevant to the, the citizens of this state. Will you be able to do this? Will you be, will you, will you create businesses for the next generation, those new technologies? Will you solve societal problems? I know most of the students in here, and frankly, I know that you are probably doing that already, and I feel good about your future intentions of doing that as you the workforce. Uh, but ultimately, you have to ask your, yourself this question. Are you going to remain true to the gift that was given to you as students 150 years ago by Justin Morrill, who provided you with the gift, gift of education that so few people in our nation at that time were able 
able to take advantage of. So to keep our funding strong, we need to be relevant. You need to be relevant. Thank you, Scott. Engineering department was established on campus. What factors do you feel that shape your program in what it is today? Well, thank you. Uh, before I begin to talk about the current state, let me just uh, provide you the context as to how engineering evolved in the University of Georgia. So, engineering at the University of Georgia was started way before it became more lab in Pakistan. So, we had historically known that in 1830s that we had a program in engineering at the University of Georgia. And Morse College was one of the buildings in which that program was housed. And uh, the programs that were in those in that college at that time were in civil engineering and later on in mechanical, mining and uh, mechanical and uh, electrical engineering. So the first degree that was granted in University of Georgia in 1868 in civil engineering. And after that, the additional degrees were added to <coughs> including there was a school of engineering that was approved around 1870. And then later on, the College of Science and Engineering in 1906. So we were offering degrees in all major engineering programs back in those days. The agricultural engineering program was organized only in 1929, much later than all these other programs were already established. It also happens to be the year when the decision was made to consolidate other engineering programs in Georgia Tech, that is civil mechanical and electrical engineering. So simultaneously when these programs were transferred to Georgia Tech, the program in agricultural engineering was approved. So it was only in 1929 that we got that approval. And from 1929 onwards, that's the only degree program we offered for several decades. So the question here is how engineering program has been shaped in the University of Georgia. This history is quite significant because agricultural engineering is standing on itself with no complementary engineering disciplines have to essentially provide the background in all those areas related to agricultural systems. So the evolution of the engineering program then was to essentially apply all various aspects of engineering discipline towards the industry of agriculture. So it has some unique from that point of view that every every aspect of engineering program was essentially towards agriculture. But it also was a disadvantage <coughs> that we didn't have the the uh, capability of exploiting the advances, major advances in, in other disciplines that were already on campus. So the degree program that we offered at that time became essentially looking at a system, and this system became an agricultural system. As we evolved, the agricultural focus began to become more systems uh, approach. And it could be applied to other industries as well. As a result of it, the agricultural Indian program became more general in its approach, applying not only to the agricultural system, also other systems. And our graduates were found to be uniquely prepared to then work in situations where a, an engineer had to look at a problem from a systems perspective rather than from a specific perspective. We have a number of graduates here. Uh, who has done well. Frank is Frank is one of our graduates. Uh, so we were then placing our graduates in all different industry areas, whether it be computer, whether it be electronics, whether it be construction, whether it be chemical. Uh, all these areas we are placing our graduates. One of the 
things that was happening at the event forum is that in the, after the successful mechanization, with which agricultural engineering was most associated with, uh, there was a significant decline in the interest in agricultural engineering, especially after the 1970s. And if you remember the tomato harvest and the hard time hard tomatoes, and the cold case that so agricultural mechanization programs were declining and so were our programs. But also the biological engineering aspects were evolving. And as was mentioned that I became very involved with my colleagues in conceptualizing the biological engineering degree in, in 1980s. And we were way ahead of the curve in that concept. And our concept was that agricultural systems are inherently biological. And we approach engineering in a more fundamental way of using biology as the science base for engineering, then we would be renewing essentially an agricultural engineering in a dimension that is critical for future. And as you can see, now biological engineering has become a very prominent area in various domains like biomedical and others, biochemical. But the concept of biological engineering, very few of us were basically from it. So as much as I'm giving you the advantages and disadvantages of the situations we're in, we are also being very creative in conceptualizing as to how those agricultural engineering programs can be reviewed, as well as conceptualizing the futuristic engineering programs. The disadvantage that we had was that while we were doing this, we didn't have the complementary engineering disciplines to let us emerge and become the known and the visible leaders of that concept. Because when this concept got accepted elsewhere, the colleges of engineering and their mind and so far as resources, steep leapfrog much ahead of what we could actually do on campus ourselves. So, I came to the University of Georgia 42 years ago, and I have seen this evolution personally for a long period of time, and became a champion of it, the idea that we should have a comprehensive engineering at the University of Georgia, and that no research university can be as viable and good without a discipline, which is essentially an enabling discipline for things that we do that we transform discoveries into things, and we transform things into those activities that is good for economic and well-being of people. So the university was inherently disadvantaged by not having, not only in the agricultural, but the university as a whole. And that is really how this evolved <coughs> the idea of biological engineering onto the concept of faculty of engineering. The title of the beginning concept is essentially borrowed from the organizations that we find in living systems. And so the faculty of engineering concept is network, entrepreneur, integration, uh, creating things by, by using discoveries from multiple fields in any domain. So the organization is such, and that's the reason it's so flat that engages all faculty and professionals to be at the university. And that is the reason we have been successful in advancing that concept. And through that, we have now come to a point where we have four major degrees that are now approved that could be offered from the University of Georgia. And but these degrees are also conceptualized not in a classical mechanical, electrical, civil concept. They are conceptualized to be integrating with other disciplines to solve problems which are not inherently confined within a discipline. So that's where the University of Georgia's engineering program is. That's how we have got to where we are. We have had disadvantages, we have advantages, but we are taking, we are taking uh, this opportunity create something so different and so new that those who have looked at our program and they have had very distinguished people come and give lectures who marvel that we can do this 
unfortunately, because we don't have the number of dollars that we give in the year, this kind of competition. So you're very blessed to have that, and we have great opportunity in the future, which is very much in line with the essence of moral act that we just described, providing education to working class that impacts the quality of life. It is the truly the gratification process of education where there is a true partnership between the government, government and public, public and private sector. Question for Mr. Smith: uh, What is the significance of having the Georgia 4-H Foundation based here on campus, and how does that lead to the university fulfilling its land right promise? Well, after the Morrell Act was passed, uh, many years later, a man named G.C. Adams uh, in Newton County, Georgia, began to uh, teach young boys how to uh, grow a better crop of corn. And the whole idea behind growing that corn was not so much to help the child learn how to grow the corn, but for the child to take that information home to his father. And uh, they were given the opportunity to grow a little corn side by side, and the, the young child had some hybrid seed corn that had come from a university research farm, and, and they planted right beside his father and changed none of the uh, cultivation practices that when harvest time came, the young child had produced more corn for acre or, or row than daddy had. And it didn't take daddy long to figure out that if he invested a little money and maybe some, some hybrid seed corn, that he could produce a better crop. And so children began to carry that message through the extension agents uh, back to the family farm. Later in this state, over in Hancock County, girls tomato clubs were born. And those clubs were about helping uh, young girls learn how to can tomato, or I don't guess they were canning in those days, but they were putting up and storing tomatoes for uh, future use in the winter. And it improved the diets of, of those families. And so the, the families learned how to preserve food from those extension agents. Of course, the Smith Lever Act didn't come along until 1914 and created the extension service, but 4 H has been around in Georgia for 10 years and actually has been around in Ohio uh, beginning in 1902. But a few years ago, uh, someone wrote a book about the history of extension and we entitled it Taking the University to the People. And that was the whole intent of the Department of Extension Service was to take the information that was sitting maybe in the libraries and on the shelves of professors' uh, offices here on campus, and get it out in the field so that uh, these people uh, that were on the farm in rural America, in rural Georgia, could have a better life and improve their uh, crop production, improve their family lifestyle. And young people began to learn more and more about uh, different subject matters. But the great thing that probably happened there that has benefited the university as much as anything is that those county agents were the door to the University of Georgia, to the College of Agriculture at that time. And those young people saw that maybe there was a better chance that I could go to school and learn. I, I, I am the son of a, of a farmer who had an eighth grade education and a mother who actually went to, a, I think she went to a little been to school, I mean, high school for a year or so. But um, my parents always encouraged me to be involved in 4-H as a child. And I can't remember whether it was, I was thinking about it this afternoon, day I can't remember whether it was 67 or 68, but my county agent brought a bunch of us to Athens one Saturday. And we sat over in the old, uh, what's now the poultry science building, it was an animal science building then, it was relatively new building back in the 60s. And, uh, uh, I can still see that uh, professor uh, standing in front of a room of, uh, you know, 12-year-old boys uh, talking about the value of the college education and uh, all the great things that we're here to offer at this university. And so it was the 4-H program that gave me the opportunity to, to come to this university. But that story is told countless times 
by people all across this state and all across this nation of how the 4-H program has opened the door for a young person to, to attain a college education. Uh, 4-H has uh, been a, a, a part of this university for, uh, ever since the early 1900s, and I think it is still very relevant today. And uh, we have, we like to say that we have 172,000 plus of the university's youngest students. And I uh, tell county agents in this state, and people that work for 4-H, our job is the most important job at the university. And that is because it is our job to help children stay enrolled in school. If we think about high school dropouts, what a problem that is. It's been in the papers in the last few days. I've read a number of articles about our high, high school dropout rate. If we can help a child, encourage a child to stay in school and finish high school, we probably turn that individual into a taxpayer and not a burden on our tax rolls. And that is the most important thing that we do at 4 H. I can sit here and, and stay here till the morning telling you stories about kids that I know that have had the opportunity to finish high school where there was no expectation of finishing high school and then they're enrolled in some university, some college, uh, technical school around the state, maybe they're in the military, but they saw the, uh, or gained the value and the knowledge that they needed to finish school. Many of those kids are here at the university. Uh, many of the young people some in the room uh, probably would not have had the opportunity to attend the University of Georgia had it not been for 4-H program and the opportunity that uh, we opened the doors to those young people. So uh, 4-H is a, a, a very important part of the university. Uh, yeah, every child at 4-H is not going to end up as a student at the university. We know that going into it. Uh, but if we can help that child realize that they're, they have dreams, opportunities out there. Uh, that is a part of the University of Georgia's mission to help improve the quality of life for every child and every person in this state. Thank you, Arthur. <laughs> Colonel Bill, this will be a uh, two-part question. Uh, the first part, what role do UGA students play in the military science department on campus, and what are the current accomplishments accomplishments of those students in the department as a whole. Okay. Um, everybody hear me? I'm kind of the farthest from the mic, so I gotta make sure that I speak up. You know, when the Morrell Act of 1862 was uh, was established, uh, military tactics was part of the curriculum. That was the requirement from the federal government. Um, in 1960, the National Defense Act took that curriculum, formalized it, and said, make ROTC. And that's where ROTC was born from that the military curriculum the original Morrell Act. Um, UGA and the ROTC program, the military program here, has had a long history, almost since the beginning of the, of the university. Um, for example, both Army posts here in Georgia, Fort Benning and Fort Gordon, are named after Franklin College UGA graduates, generals that fought in the Civil War. Um, prior to what Hollywood will tell you, it was not Chuck Norris, it was a UGA class of 52, Colonel Charles Steele, who founded the Delta Force. Uh, uh, the, uh, the current general, uh, commanding general of the 82nd Airborne, uh, was class of 80, uh, General Huggins. And so we've been here for a long time, and we've had a lot of students that have participated in the military here at UGA. We've had two uh, cadets uh, make the ultimate sacrifice since 2001, Ashley Huff and Lieutenant Noah Harris. Um, today, uh, the ROTC program, we have about 170 cadets. Um, they range from a 17-year-old right out of high school that may or may not have an Army scholarship to a 30-year-old combat vet who has a wife and a child. Um, all the cadets, they major in just about everything that EGA has to offer. They participate in all the clubs. They participate in all the uh, activities around campus. Um, but what do they do? What are their current accomplishments? Um, you know, we, we send, I send uh, cadets to airborne school to learn how to jump out of planes. I send cadets to air assault school to learn how to repel that helicopter with the of equipment. I send them to Northern Warfare School, uh, Mountain Warfare School. I send them down to Combat High School in Key West, Florida to 
learn how to be combat divers. Um, this year I sent in four people that were hand selected for the new Army CULT program, Cultural Understanding and Language Program. Two males, two females, uh, one going to Korea, one going to Tunisia, and two females, one going to Ukraine, and one going to the Federated States of Micronesia. They're going there to teach foreign military how to speak English. And so the military program here at UGA is producing that quality leader uh, in the you know, we're not here for cannon fodder. We're not all going to graduate from Afghanistan and die. That's not what I'm here for. I wear a patch that says leadership, and that's what I'm here to teach these young students and these cadets. And that's what they go off and they do, whether they're active duty army or whether they're National Guard Reserve or even a doctor or lawyer or whatever. Um, I'm here to teach the leaders, and that's what, they, uh, that's what they're here to do. Last semester, uh, the 170 cadets averaged a 3.03 uh, grade point average. Uh, sophomores a 3.21, one of my highest, highest class. Um, for me, the most telling accomplishment of the department is as the government is slashing funds, telling the Defense Department to, uh, to get rid of things and find ways of saving money. Um, ROTCs around the nation are being getting ready to told to shut down, and you guys are not producing. You're not producing the quality leader or the quantity of the leader. And at the same time, they're getting ready to tell that, they're telling me to produce more. And so uh, they like what we're producing here. EGA has a well uh, and, and long military history. We're small, 35,170, so we're maybe not as visible, but long, proud tradition, and the department should be proud of producing one of today. Thank you very much. Sir. And, uh, Commissioner Black, you get what you want last. Um, what is the uh, role of Georgia agriculture and its relationship uh, with the university? I'm going to begin answering this question before Bob Bizzle asks any more questions. I'm going to look right dead in the camera and I'm going to say I'm Gary Black and I'm not smarter than the fifth grade. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and get that out of the way. Y'all, and to the students, I think about y'all a lot because I, I, I love you and I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I've gone to Washington a lot in my career over the last 30 years. The dean goes a lot. He just got back from Washington right before we walked through the doors. Uh, to, to dispel any rumor, he or, he or I, we did not know Mr. Morrell. We were not there. <laughs> we, 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 we've been around a while. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, Colonel, uh, it is a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with this, this distinguished family. It's a lot of, a lot of good folks in the room. Uh, how we look at the university and its relationship toward agriculture. I think one of the best, you know, it's the best comparisons that we can make as far as uh, when it comes to agriculture and the land grant university, uh, I think it's still the purest relationship out there when, when it comes to why we really, why, why we really did this uh, at military mission, certainly. But, but when, it, when it comes to the other parts of this bigger university that's grown to uh, you know to you know to, to a huge deal and the, you know the, 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 our, our society has changed we've moved from what some would think is we've moved from an agrarian society when in fact we just we've just become lots more efficient we're still I think most of the most everybody in the room knows from an economic standpoint is still a strong powerhouse here in but we look at the agricultural relationship to the university and we're, we're still the true, pure benefactor and participant in the original land grant mission. And, and I think that, that relationship is one of, uh, you know, perhaps even somewhat of a parent and child, somewhat of uh, a teacher and pupil or uh, mentor and neophyte, whatever, that, that, that Agricultural producers and agricultural businesses, you know, deep have a deep respect for the university, have a, have, have a, a very strong reliance on its unbiased scientific uh, uh, the, 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 the generation of information and research in order for, for agriculture to be stronger and better. And so that. Uh, that relationship on the farmer and, and by the and by the way by the alien season shipping season starts tomorrow so I can be able to uh, maybe see those in the store start tomorrow uh, 
if not a total one tonight. But uh, they're, uh, um, you know, they're, uh, when they look at the disease problems that they've had last uh, this year, who do they look to? They look to this university. Uh, and when we uh, we we have the uh, Fred Miller and I were talking, and, and then just just before we started, uh, looking at the opportunities, how do we have value in the Georgia problems? How do we grow jobs? How do we look at the, this economy and, 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 and really take what we do well and expand that uh, for future generations? Who, who do producers, who do not, who do entrepreneurs, who do uh, agribusiness leaders look to? They look to this university. And so I, I think that relationship is alive and well and, and as strong as, as ever. Uh, we look back to this department, I mean, our department was we were way up right there pretty close together. We were, this is the first state department of agriculture in America. We started in 1874. It was long about the money at the same time. But I guess my, almost my favorite uh, history lesson of Georgia has come about in the last three years. We've tried to revive the department a little bit, so we've heard a little bit of the story before. But uh, we, uh, I, I didn't really stumble on this about three and a half years ago. Georgia's has a has a great seal. You know, it's the great seal of Georgia. If we ask her one in the room, you could probably identify it pretty clearly. It has the arch. It would have wisdom, justice, and moderation, which we would have learned in eighth grade was our motto, is our motto. And it's built upon the foundation of the Constitution. And, uh, it's the state of Georgia. And I think now it says 1776, but what I discovered three and a half years ago is that Georgia is one of a handful of states that actually has a two-sided seal. There's, a, there's another side of the Georgia state seal. And uh, it's interesting, it's only been amended. The law that passed for our great seal, I believe it passed in 1799, it's only been amended once. It's only amended, I believe, 1914, 1917, when 1799 is what used to be on the front of the seal. It was changed to 1776 to reflect the revolution. Other than that, our state seals have never been changed. Why is that important? Because when you look at the law, the law says in paragraph A, there should be a state seal, the Secretary of State shall keep it. Then paragraph B is what I love. Paragraph B says this, the first in order of importance. It says on the seal there should be a ship at anchor at wharf taking on hogsheads of tobacco and cotton and shall be flying the colors of the United States. And that should be emblematic of our state's exports. There should be a smaller vessel on the inland waterway taking on the same, meaning hogsheads of tobacco and cotton, emblematic of our state's internal trade. The side of the hill shall be a man in the act of plowing, and there should be a flock of sheep in various postures, I think is what the law says, uh, underneath the flourish, flourishing tree, and shall have inscribed their own the words, actually says inscribed their own the motto, agriculture and commerce. And then paragraph C says this, and I love the first words. The device on the other side shall have an arch and shall have the words wisdom, justice, and moderation. So my point that here is how do we, from, from a past standpoint, Bob, our relationship has been very strong. Agriculture, forestry, those kind of things have been what we've been known for since our founding. It's on our seal. And I argue it's on the front of the seal, not the back. Because <laughs> uh, it's first one mentioned in the law. And so that, that is a, that's a very important point to remember. And we can celebrate through the Mormon Act and everything, our accomplishments, our relationship, how agriculture applies on it today. But to everyone who might ever see this state or who's in this room, be on notice. It is our future as well. And one of the challenges with the university is, and with the industry is to make sure that our relationship moving forward is just as strong as it has been in the past. Because that's what makes Georgia strong. We're, 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 we, have a, we, have a, we have a really, really good thing going, and we need to make sure that all of us 
you know, folks in leadership positions, people who get to vote on this kind of stuff. And then, you know, plus your neighbor next door. Uh, they need to know this, and, and it's why we're glad we've got a good team here to go tell the story. Thanks. Thank you very much. Over here, that actually might be smaller than the fifth <laughs> Not more than a sixth grade. I'm getting a signal from our uh, leadership down here that we run out of time for the panelists. Uh, but please give them all a uh, round of applause. <laughs> and they will be around for questions afterward, uh, especially for, for the press and here. And I would like to call on uh, SGA President Mallory Davis to give our closing remarks. Thank you, Mr. Insler. Would y'all give them, our panelists, another warm round of applause for us? At this time, Ms. Sally Ann Barrow, Associate Director of Alumni Relations for UGA, will now present our panelists with a token of our gratitude, courtesy of the Alumni Association. We truly appreciate everything you have done to make this successful event. Each of our panelists have been here. And while she's hanging that up, I also would be remiss if I didn't uh, congratulate the hard work of many of the students sitting down here in the front from the College of Agriculture um, on the SGA as well as um, their master program. So congratulations to them. It is an honor to be with each of you this evening as we celebrate this 150th anniversary of the Moral Acts. The University of Georgia is often recognized as the flagship institution as well as the land grant, sea grant, University of the State of Georgia. But it is imperative for students to remember how important these accolades truly are for the integrity of our degrees. In 1785, Abraham Baldwin never could have imagined the tremendous contributions to society that are made through made possible for the ideals of Justin Moore Smith. As we move into another academic year, students, faculty, welcome guests, let us not forget our roots. We have come a long way from the original $2,000 appropriation for the establishment of the College of Agriculture. Today, it should be our charge, our challenge, to unify North and South Carolina. For far too long, Sanford Stadium, as well as the Tate Student Center, have represented an invisible divide separating our magnificent campus. Let us strive for the removal of these barriers and stigmas created over the years and past, and come together as a university in the years to come. Thank you for all those who attended this evening, and here's to another 150 years. God bless and go dogs.